September 17, spent the night by myself crawling around in front and noting the places most in need of wire. I came across a German post with four men in it and a light machine, gun. They were well forward, quite isolated and obviously nervous. I told the nearest company, but they wouldn't do anything, and even looked frightened to think that there were real live Germans so near them. A sod splashed down in the trench outside and I noticed the orderly at the door, a lad about eighteen jump and nearly drop his rifle. It all makes one very sad if you look back upon the days when there would have been a clamour to go and snaffle that post. And this is the division which captured and lost one village seven times on one bloody day, and finally held it against all attacks with a fifth of its effectors on their feet. September 18. The men went back into reserve billets today, but I stayed on with the relieving section. The ground is beginning to dry again, and life becomes more pleasant. There is great aerial activity and the Hun shoots very much on our roads and back areas. Surely we are not preparing a stunt, September 19. Received orders to return to reserve billets as we are going out of the line. Spent a busy day handing over work and packing up as the whole company moves tomorrow. September 20, trek to our new billets in reserve which are almost out of the war. Even the 60 pounders are well in front of us. Spent a quiet day making cover for the men, rigging up horse lines and generally settling down. There is more billeting accommodation than we have seen for months, and greatest joy of all, we can sleep in our pyjamas. September 21. Apparently there is some kind of a stunt coming off, because we have instructions to rest the men as much as possible and give them an easy time. Accordingly we do a little drill, paint our transport, clean rifles and ammunition, overhaul explosives, etc., etc., etc. There is some fascination about this war game, some inexplicable grip which it has over us. In spite of everything we have gone through, there is, once more, a thrill of expectation in the air, and the men seem keener, as though looking forward to something. No one could hate war more than I do, and yet I would be bitterly disappointed if sent on leave tomorrow. And if we, of all men, can still feel moments of exhilaration, can there ever be a League of Nations? September 22. The usual instruction work and overhauling of equipment. Orders came through today that we are to give the men instruction in attack, open warfare, and extended order formations. The men enjoy it and are cheering up tremendously. There are now several new divisions in our area. Guns are coming forward and more troops arrive every day, all of them apparently from the south. They seem fresher and more confident than our own men, but they have already had the experience of driving Huns before them. We, on the other hand, have been fighting a losing fight with our backs to the wall for over seven months. A lot of kilted troops arrived today. September 23, had the men out all day practicing attack formation. It is hard to believe that these fiercely rushing groups of men are the same troops who were fought to a standstill at Camel and held that blood-soaked line with such dogged fatalism through the weary summer. And after two or three days' rest, they are expected to go forward again. A man must feel proud, September 24, training hard, in spite of high hopes dashed before, we seem as keen as ever to make another effort. The atmosphere seems charged with electricity, more troops are pouring in, and the broad gauge railway is up nearly as far as our billets, was recommended again for an MC, these time due to appear in the King's Christmas Honours list, September 25. We are still without orders, but the attack must be near at hand now expectation and excitement. September 26. Received preliminary orders that day, and I will take a section each and join the artillery brigades to make roads and bridges for them in the advance. Two sections remain in reserve under Cooper. Attack before dawn on the 28th. Went up to the brigade to arrange details and went to bed on return. Roused after an hour's sleep to go out with a section to repair two forward bridges near the front line before daybreak. Got about twenty men and miscellaneous material onto two pontoon wagons, and started out in drizzling rain. I sat in the front of the first wagon, and as we lumbered off into the dark, I fell into a sort of reverie. I thought lazily of home and of the twenty-eighth, and the things it might mean, and in my mind I went again over the characters of the men, the good ones and the doubtful ones, and detailed them off for different jobs. These and a thousand other thoughts wandered idly through my mind, punctuated by the jolting of the wagon and the barking of the eighteen-pounders. Then the men began to sing, very quietly and sweetly, and the rise and fall of their voices seemed to add some special significance to the night. We made good progress over the bad roads, 
stopping occasionally to check our way or adjust a girth. Now they were singing Annie Laurie, and I heard Garner say, damn, under his breath. I asked him what was the matter with them tonight, and he said, dunno, sir, but I wish they wouldn't sing like that. The rain had developed into a heavy scotch mist which swallowed up the lead driver and the mounted corporal. I shivered under my coat and felt unutterably lonely and sad. At last, the wagon stopped and we went forward on foot towards the work. We bridged three trenches and then came to the main job, a fifteen-foot span across a swollen beat, and not more than four hundred yards from the German lines. For about an hour the work went quietly and well, and we got an arch across the stream in the form of an old French steel shelter. Suddenly, there was a short, fierce whine a crash and a livid burst of flame right in the party. Three more followed almost instantaneously, and then for a second, an awful silence. Someone said Christ, and began to cry, gently. Five men were killed, three of them practically missing, and three badly wounded. By a miracle the work was practically undamaged. We took the casualties to the wagons and returned to the job. How the men worked there again I shall never know, but they did and the bridge was across an hour before dawn. The suddenness of the shock has knocked my nerves to pieces and, even as I write my hand, trembles. Looking back now I can see something unnatural in the whole of that ride in the pontoons. Little details were too impressive, and there was an almost unhuman beauty in the way they sang that song. I am sure that some of those men had a vague premonition of what was coming. September 27. Lay down for a few hours after we got back, but was unable to sleep. At midday I took nose, two and three sections to four billets at Pigsty Farm, and at 5 p.m. No, three section moved out again to join their brigade. No, three section moved out again to join their brigade. The company transport and reserve sections arrived about 9 p.m. Major and I had a final talk together, and I turned in about 11 p.m. I was nervous and excited, and although very tired, slept but little. September 28. No, two section breakfasted at 2.15 a.m.m., and were ready on the road at 3.30. Whilst I was inspecting them, the barrage started on our left for the Belgian attack, and the northern sky was bubbling with light. We reached Brigade, HQ, at the Chateau, about 5.15, and at 5.30 our barrage started and the frontline troops went over. The scheme was that we were to go forward at once and make a track passable for 18, pounders from their present positions up to second jumping, offline. They were expected to be there about noon, and would then be in a position to support the further advance of the infantry. Everything depended on getting the field guns forward to support the second attack. I left the transport at the chateau under the corporal, and led the men forward towards a half-dried-up canal, which was the first break in the road. It was raining heavily. It soon became apparent that the Germans were maintaining a barrage on this side of the canal, and as time was against us, we had got to go through it. It looked rough and ugly and the men were looking at each other. For a moment I was tempted. We were absolutely alone and it was up to me. Nobody could blame us if we didn't go through, and in an hour it would probably have stopped. We were perhaps five hundred yards from the canal and shells were bursting heavily. There was no cover, and at times the canal banks were obscured by the fumes and smoke from the bursts. Something outside a man takes hold of him at these times, and tells him what to do. In half a minute I was calmly saying, Come on, and the men were following in single file, about ten paces from man to man. I thought we should never get across. We tried to run but we kept sticking in the mud and bunching together, just like a nightmare. Once or twice I looked round and the men were grand. Two fellows were hit and the others dragged them across. Then a third went down and was picked up by the two behind. Eventually, we were under the shelter of the canal bank with one man killed and two wounded. It was great, and after that I felt we could do anything. By now we were soaked to the skin, but bunches of prisoners were coming back and the worst seemed to be over. We worked steadily on the roads under fairly continuous shell, fire, and by 10 a.m. the track was completed. After this, the German shell fire weakened as the advance went forward, and his guns were either taken or forced to withdraw. The men were worn out and literally covered with mud, so I withdrew to some old dugouts in the canal bank. A message was sent for the transport to come forward and another one to the company for rum. The men had just lit fires and were beginning to dry themselves when I received a message that the guns had reached their destination, but our further help was wanted at once. At 11.30, the section moved forward again and by 2 p.m. the whole brigade were standing to for action in their new positions. 
The division moved up into line during the afternoon, and the advance pushed on. White skater machines and the War Nital line are reported captured. At 4 p.m., the section returned to the canal, awaiting further orders. The brigade commander personally thanked me for the day's work. At 4.30, I received news that the transport was stuck somewhere behind us, but they were trying to get the limber forward with six horses in it instead of the normal two. The tool, cart, had been abandoned. Eventually, the limber arrived, and then I sent four horses back for the tool cart, which arrived about 6.30 via I press. The roads are in a terrible state and will do more than the Huns to hold us up. At seven, the men had a meal, the first since 2 a. This morning, and after that, turned into a more than well-earned rest. I went over to see the colonel and learnt that they are pushing on over the hills and Cummins is to be captured to. Morrow. Everyone is delighted. The show has been a great success, and casualties are light in comparison with the results. The only trouble is the mud, with which we are literally covered from head to foot. September 29. Our rations arrived about 5 a.m., but no forage for the horses, and we were unable to move forward in consequence. My biggest trouble is going to be to keep in touch with supplies and water during this nomadic life. Roads were reported passable as far as the front, so I left the section standing to under the sergeant and rode off to find the company. I hunted about all morning and found them at last at the old place, but just ready to move off. Arranged to draw rations direct from the company each day with my own limber. I took two nose bags of corn back with me on my mare, gave the limber horses a feed when I reached the section, and then sent them back for rations. Somehow or other, the company has heard some very highly colored accounts of our passage through the barrage on the 28th. At 2 p.m., I rode forward with an orderly and visited the brigade and all battery. Heavy rain set in again, and as everyone seemed fairly comfortable and there was no accommodation forward, I decided to spend another night at the canal. The road is blocked with traffic from morning till night, and I am afraid it will break up badly if the rain continues. The whole show depends on that one. Blessed road and apparently it is going to be my job for two or three days more until the course troops can get up. The brigade was in action when I reached them and a stiff fight was going on around the last ridges. The Huns are sticking a bit and a fierce counter. Attack had just been driven back. Rifle and machine. Gun fire was very intense. I saw a lot of Hun dead about the roads and a few of our fellows. The Huns have left a lot of guns behind and should be fairly hard hit. It was dark when I got back, and the horses could hardly crawl along. Rations and forage came up shortly afterwards, so we turned in and had a good night's rest. September 30. Heavy rain all last night. At 8 a.m. I sent two orderlies up to brigade and my groom back to the company to change my mare. She was completely exhausted. Pending receipt of orders, we rigged up a shelter for the horses, as they were shivering badly and I began to be frightened for them. The poor beasts are caked with mud, and even their eyes are hardly free from it. At noon, received orders to go forward as early as possible, so I sent half the limber back for rations, and moved up with the section. After a really terrific struggle, we got as far as the batteries and managed to find a bit of cover in some old German concrete dugouts worked till dark on the road, and then started to fix things up for the night. The dugouts were in the middle of a swamp, about 500 yards from the road, and in the dark, it took us three quarters of an hour to reach them. I had to give up all idea of getting the horses across, and finally found a place where they could stand about a mile from the dugouts. The drivers were quite worn out, so we had to mount a stable guard of sappers, with instructions to move the horses every hour to prevent them sinking in the mud. It is still raining bitterly cold and I can't understand how the poor beasts live. The wagons are nearly axle-deep. Shortly after midnight, I had everyone settled and then crawled, literally, into my own shack. It is an old, Bosch concrete place and stinks like hell. There are two wooden bunks in it, but it is dry. My man lit a fire on the floor, and we warmed up some old tea in my shaving mug. I was chilled to the bone, and there was nothing to eat, but I shall always believe that that tea saved my life. There was no room for officer and servant there, just two very weary men. We sat on either side the fire drying our socks, and the smell mingled with the fetid odors of the dugout. Our eyes grew red and tearful with the smoke, which eventually drove us to the uninviting boards, where we slept like the babes in the wood. Several times during the night, I woke up shivering with cold, and the clammy clothes sticking to my skin, but 
We were over the hills and I would not have missed that night for all the gold in Africa.